Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, I am really excited to be introducing Valerie Marshall and Patty Fuchs, um, who both applied for and were awarded NASA at my library grants. Um, and this is a, this grant was a little bit different than the NASA at my library grant that we did here earlier this year where uh, folks came in from around the state for a training with NASA. And so um, they were actually part of a grant where they received kits that they were able to use um, for programming. And so they're going to share just some of the activities that they were able to do and give you ideas if you, uh, moving forward, would like to create your own kits. And um, they're going to give you ideas on how to do that with no or very low budget. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Miss Valerie and let her get going. Okay, Valerie, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Valerie Marshall, and I work for the Broward County Library System, which is one of the largest in Florida. And if you can't tell from my picture, I want to be a wizard. That is my ultimate life goal. And the closest thing I could find in real life to doing that was doing STEM programs. So that is why I'm here today talking to you about STEM kits for your libraries. So the NASA at My Library grant is designed to offer STEM activities to the public, um, especially groups that are underrepresented in traditional STEM fields, which include African Americans, girls, um, people who are differently abled. And I found that really exciting because my background before libraries was actually in a science museum. So after I graduated from library school and I couldn't find a job in libraries, I actually had gotten a certificate to work in museums and I ended up at a science museum in Miami and it was one of the best experiences that I've ever had. But before that, I had no science background and it just really excited me to make STEM fun and engaging for the public. And then when I got into libraries a couple of years later, customers kept coming in and asking me how to do their science fair projects and I'm sure that you've had the same experience. So when I saw this opportunity for this grant, I thought it was a perfect fit for what I was trying to do in my community. So as I mentioned, community members underrepresented in the library and in STEM benefit from these types of STEM programs that we're going to be talking about and resources that are provided by the people who have made the grant up, which is NASA in collaboration with the Space Science Institute. This was also a catalyst for me to partner with the school board which we've been trying to partner with specifically the STEM sector of the school board for years. And I was also able to bring in local STEM businesses and nonprofits, including an amateur astronomer association and local teachers who are doing different types of presentations, the environmental sector of Broward County. It's, it's just been an amazing catalyst to work with so many great people. And I'm hoping you can do the same. One of the requirements of the NASA at My Library grant is to plan a large scale, highly publicized event. And going from all of the questions I was getting for science fair um, projects, I decided to create a science fair readiness festival. And I'm actually in the process of planning it for this year. We're having it on October 5th, and we're actually expecting a large amount of attendance. But the way that I designed it is it is a scavenger hunt all of the customers come in, they get a scavenger hunt sheet, and they have to do different things related to doing research. So they have to check out material, they have to fill out a survey, they have to attend a presentation, and we have a bunch of hands-on STEM activities, both from vendors in the community involving coding and robots and flying drones, to different things that are provided, which we'll be talking about from the kit. And the the presentations are amazing. I have a scientist this year who's going to be talking about shark and sea turtle research. And I'm actually doing a presentation with a member of our local school board about how to use library resources to research your science fair project. And teachers are even giving extra credit for attendance, which is amazing because you really get people to come out for this. It's so fun. 
as you can see from my attendance in 2017, which was the first year that we did this event, I had 892 people show up, which is impressive. And if you think that I was at a 20,000 square foot library, it was just completely unexpected and astronomical. So there's definitely a need and a want in the community for this type of programming. And last year we had 1,100 people. This year I actually get to move the event to a larger library, one of our regionals. So we're expecting 1,500 to 2,000 people. And if I'm able to, through an email, I'll let you know how many we actually get. So in addition to the large scale event, these types of kits and activities have helped me to reach out to the Seminole Tribe of Florida which is part of one of the underrepresented groups in STEM fields. And we've had so much fun going to their story times and going to their summer camps and just doing all of these hands-on activities. I've also been able to teach homeschool science classes through the library. We've had teen volunteers who do their volunteer orientation as icebreakers with these activities and they've had so much fun. And I've also been able to um, reach one of the most elusive groups, at least for me, the middle schoolers, I take out one of the how-to games, which we're gonna talk, to, talk about soon, and they win prizes if they can put the things in the right order, and they just get so excited. I've also done in-house field trips with some of the activities we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, and I've, got, I've been able to do field trips with 90 to 100 kids with very little budget, and, and they keep coming back, so it's really nice. And one of the things that I have done, which is the purpose of this webinar, is I recreated some NASA kits. They weren't exactly what I received from the grant, but they're similar to what we're talking about today for 38 branches, and the budget was very low. And we had the ability to reach up to 5,000 people with these activities, and it was just an amazing opportunity, especially with last year's summer programming. So let's get into it. First of all, I want you to know, like I mentioned, when I worked at a science museum, I had no science background. So it's okay that you're not a scientist. All you need to do is let your customers know that you're not a scientist. Tell them that you're a librarian. I know that seems obvious, but just tell them and say, you can help them find books if they have further questions, but you're doing the activity alongside them. Something that we learned in our trainings that we've attended for the grant is we have learned to be a guide on the side instead of a sage on the stage. So you don't need to talk to people as though you're an expert. You can say, I'm participating with you. And part of science, part of experimentation is trial and error. There is no failure. You learn from doing something a different way. And sometimes you might come up with new science that nobody's ever thought of before. So it's definitely okay that you're not a scientist. So, when you're talking to customers about this not being a scientist thing, some things you can use to facilitate these STEM programs is questions like, tell your neighbors something that you already know about this topic. For example, if you're talking about the solar system, ask them how many planets they think we have in the solar system. You don't have to be the only teacher in the class. For example, you might have a customer who said, Keisha said that Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. That makes me think about the asteroid belt. And you can go from there. You, you can be amazed by some of the insights that especially the children in your audience might have that you didn't think of or that helps you to further what you're talking about. You can also ask open-ended questions like, what do you think is happening or will happen with this experiment? Or how do you think this topic is related to what we talked about or did earlier when you're wrapping up? And engaging people in a conversation is the first step in engaging them in STEM, and it's a very valuable tool. You also have the opportunity through these STEM kits and just through STEM in general to plug your library resources. Again, say, I'm a librarian. You can check out a book about these topics or a DVD or use one of our online resources. It is such a fantastic way to increase your statistics in areas, especially in nonfiction, that don't often get checked out. The first activity we're going to talk about that I would encourage you to include as part of your kits is called Space Elevator. This is actually something that I learned 
from a conference on nanoscience that I went to when I was working at the Science Museum, and it's the easiest thing. I am guessing that at least some of you didn't know that scientists are actually talking about building an elevator that goes from the Earth to the moon. They're using uh, nanocarbon tubes for the wiring of the elevator, and you don't have to get into all of that with the kids, but this activity, all you need is a dry erase board, some drawing paper, and some drawing or coloring implements, and what you do is you draw a big rectangle, you say, this is my space elevator, you draw your little stick figures if you are as accomplished of an artist as I am, and you tell them these are your astronauts, and then you ask everybody, okay, if we did build an elevator from the Earth to the moon, it would take them two weeks to get there. So what would our astronauts need to survive on the elevator? And you'll get all kinds of amazing activities and ideas from these kids who go from the needs of oxygen, water, and a bathroom to talking about things they want like video games or tablets. And, and it's just so creative and so fun. And then at the end of it, you can tell them that they are really giving ideas to NASA because this is a real thing that's happening. The next activity I would encourage you to talk about is called Pocket Solar System. Again, very light on supplies. All you need is receipt paper, although I encourage you not to steal it from your circulation department because they get kind of unhappy about that. So it's pretty cheap to buy. And you can also uh, just provide drawing and coloring implements. And what you do is you're teaching the kids that space is called space for a reason and that there is a lot of space between all of the planets. They're not all lined up directly. And they get to make their own solar system that's about the length of their arm. And you fold the paper in different sections to show exactly how far apart Earth is from Mars or Earth is from Jupiter if your solar system were the size of your arm. This picture um, shows generally what a lot of the public thinks about the solar system. Uh, basically that you can actually see the orbits or that the planets are equidistant apart and it just this is just for um, us to understand what the solar system might look like but it's not to scale and so the idea of this activity is to give you a better concept of why space is called space. And again, I've put up something like this. I added this into the slides so that you have something to put up if you do choose to do this activity. It gives them an idea of how they could draw their planets on their pocket solar system if they wanted to be a little bit more artistic with it. The next activity, this is one that I've used very often, and this is the one that I was talking about really engages middle schoolers particularly as a set of sorting games. And they're just cards that you can print on card stock and use over and over again for outreach and in-house activities. And the link is in these, um, in the slides. Unfortunately, we can't open them during the presentation, but you are welcome to open them on your own or on, you know, while you're looking at this. And it's such easy sorting games. You can have the how big game is the easiest and you have cards like an eagle, versus the sun. So obviously you know which ones go in order, but when I do this with people, I have a big crowd of people and I just hand them cards and say, okay, talk to each other and see what you think, how you think these can go together. So it doesn't just have to be in the order of how big, how far, or how hot. You get people to think of different ways that these objects might fit together or why they might work with each other. And it gets a really good collaboration going among people. I put in some of the instructions for how big, how far, and how hot so that you can understand how it works. So this slide explains that. And these are some of the questions that you can ask people while you're doing the activity. You can keep it as open-ended as you want. So you can ask people things like, were you able to draw upon your knowledge and experiences? Were others in your group invited to share their knowledge and experiences? And why should we take the time to invite our audiences to share their prior knowledge? Well, my answer to that is that we really want our public to take ownership of STEM. It's not just us trying to teach them. We are teachers in our own sense, but it's not a standard classroom setting. We really want, and the goal of this grant is we really want people 
to want to do STEM and want to come to the library at the same time and have fun with it and make it their own. So these are the answers. And again, these slides are for you. I know you have the link to the activity, but you can see how simple the objects are and the cards are really nicely done. The artwork is great. How far gets a little bit harder than how big. So you can see um, it depends on your perspective. One of the things we learned in one of our trainings is that if you live in a place where there are not eagles and the Hubble Space Telescope happens to be above you, you might be closer to the Hubble Telescope than you are to an eagle, depending upon your perspective. So that's one of those fun things that could start a great conversation. How hot is the hardest activity? And this is the one that the middle and the high schoolers really engage with because off the top of your head, I'm sure that a lot of you wouldn't know the temperature of comet surface of a comet surface or of lava. And that's something that even though I've played the game, I don't fully remember. So it's nice to hear people's arguments of what they think should go in this order. Art and the Cosmic Connection is a wonderful activity um, that again, needs very little material and usually things that you already have. Um, drawing paper, oil pastels, Q-tips, and paper towels. And what you're doing is you are learning about the stories that planetary objects can tell you just by how their surface looks. And this is going to be an example of the different shapes that you can have your kids draw that will tell the story of their own planet. Circles mean craters. So circles and um, craters, I mean, when they when something impacts the surface of a planet, it leaves a hole. And that looks like an almost perfect circle from far away. But even on planets that are far away, we can tell if they're getting hit by a lot of things from space. And that helps us judge whether there's a strong atmosphere on that planet or object. And these little blobby shapes that just got highlighted on the left of the screen, they can either indicate a lake or a volcano because you can't really tell how raised or how indented the surface is from such a distance. But that's where the kids can come in and say, my planet has a bunch of volcanoes and this is how you can tell. This big blob over here you can assume is a lake because um, you'll see in as we click through that there are streams coming off of it. So you can assume that there might have been water or another type of liquid coming off of that lake as opposed to being a volcano. And those are the streams that I was talking about that just got highlighted on the screen. And the last shape that you would talk about um, are straight lines and those indicate earthquakes or tectonic activity. So using these shapes and just engaging your kids, you can really have them understand that geology from a distance is still so valuable for us understanding what's going on in planets and other objects immediately around Earth and even further away. UV Kid is by far the most popular activity that I do at any time because solar beads are like magic. So I talked about wanting to be a wizard. This is the closest I've gotten because solar beads will change color when they're exposed to UV radiation. So you can either do this and have the kids go outside and test their UV kid, or you can have a black light, which will have the same effect. And the idea is to make either a little, a little guy out of a pipe cleaner, which is what the photo shows, or I'll often make a bracelet instead of the little guy and you put pony beads and solar beads onto the bracelet or the little UV kid. And then the optional materials that are listed are honestly anything you can find. And what you talk about is what different materials might protect your skin, which is represented by the solar beads from sunburn or UV radiation. And you can talk about different types of sunscreen. You can test them out. You can make clothes for your little UV kid. It's a super fun activity and the kids get to feel like they take a little bit of magic home. Wind streamers are really easy and again, really fun and not a lot of materials or materials that you might already have. You can see the photo, it's just paper plates and crepe paper, but you get to talk about how the wind can affect weather, 
and how you can tell the direction of the wind. And down here in Florida, it helps us relate during hurricane season how we really need meteorologists and, and it gets kids excited about those types of careers and really helping the environment just by understanding that wind is part of weather. Now I want to talk about where all of these activities came from, which is through StarNet and all of these resources are just so key in having a successful program. The StarNet Clearinghouse gives you a list of activities similar to what I showed you, including how-to videos, a teacher written guide, and a guide for all of your uh, participants. They're really amazing resources. Um, and you'll see all of the other things that StarNet has for you, newsletters, events, community dialogues, which is where you get uh, people talking about what they want from you related to STEM. And just, I encourage you to look at all of these resources, but especially the Clearinghouse. Another resource we learned about through the NASA at My Library grant is called Solar System Ambassadors. And so I mentioned at my large event that I get a local amateur astronomers association to come out. They are part of the solar system ambassadors. And there is just a huge uh, amount of local stakeholders that are willing to help and participate in this type of activity. This tells you how to find a local solar system ambassador. Um, and the solar system ambassadors um, that I've found in Florida are anything from students that are at the local colleges to just enthusiasts about science. They've come in and they do free speeches for the public on resources that NASA and the Space Science Institute provide for them. So they already have their presentation set up and you just need to talk to them and get them involved. They're usually happy to do it. The Night Sky Network is when a local group will come out and bring telescopes to your library, which is really exciting. I just had last week, um, our local group came out and there was a woman who was part of our citizenship class. She was in her 50s and she was so excited because she said it was the first time she had ever seen space and ever looked through a telescope and that was just so touching. And again, this is a free resource for you. These groups really want to come out and it's a great partnership. And this just shows how many Night Sky Network participants are out there, especially in Florida, we have a bunch. If you have any questions, Again, my name is Valerie Marshall. I work in Broward. I'm always available, although I do respond better to emails. And I truly hope this is helpful to you, your library system, and your community. Have a great day. This is Melissa jumping in. Thank you, Valerie. Does anybody have any questions for Valerie before we get moving on to Patty? And we'll just take a second here to pause and see if anybody's got any questions. And in case you didn't see my comment in the chat, just a reminder that you will receive a copy of these slides in the follow up. So if there was information you couldn't quite get written down, you will receive it with all the links and all that good stuff. Thanks, Casey. Okay, I don't see anything coming in. So um, we are going to move on to Patty. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, my name is Patty Fuchs, and I uh, work for the Indian River County Library System. We are a much smaller system than, uh, than Broward, um, but we do our best. <laughs> um, so I did get to do some very interesting things with uh, NASA before even this particular program, before the NASA at my library um, program. They ran a couple of uh, special workshops for librarians at the Kennedy Space Center for one for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter when that happened and uh, also for the Mose, uh, Mars Rover uh, Curiosity before that went up and that was my first big introductions into really doing STEM and I was also someone who does not have a science background at all always had vague interest in it but was always quite honestly a little scared of it and that's why I wanted you know, to reiterate what Valerie was saying about don't be afraid of the fact that you're not an expert in these things. You know, we're librarians. You know, we all know we're trained to find the answers. We don't necessarily have all the answers. So don't be afraid to jump into this stuff and always know that 
I can't tell you how many times I've been in a program where a child or a parent asked a question that I didn't have an answer to. But all you have to say is, come back with me and we'll find that answer. So, so never be afraid to try to try this stuff. Um, I also wanted to reiterate about the uh, Solar System Ambassadors. We are really lucky living in Florida. Having been a part of the program, we uh, NASA, my library program, we were sent out to training in Colorado. So we had the opportunity to meet a lot of other librarians in other parts of the country who uh, don't have the same resource we do. Being so close to the Kennedy Space Center, you know, as Valerie mentioned, you have people who are students or uh, just, you know, um, really interested in space. But we have a lot of people will come out and do talks for us that are either retired um, KSC employees or even currently working there or with the companies that work with them. So I really uh, uh, want to encourage you to check that out. It's a great resource for all of us uh, living in Florida. So to get into some of my favorite activities, uh, one of the favorites I've done, actually picked this one up originally in one of those uh, earlier workshops, was Crater Creations. And Crater Creations uh, lets us explore uh, craters and how they're formed and what we can learn from them. Um, it's a great activity to do with elementary age. You can do it with younger. Uh, they will enjoy it. Obviously, they won't get quite as much out of it. Um, but it, it can be fun if you have a lot of parental uh, help. Uh, the uh, materials are all things that you can get locally, Publix, Dollar General, that kind of thing. Uh, the materials I listed there, I did not list uh, tarps. You want tarps for this activity, trust me. <laughs> so basically what you want to do with this one is show images uh, first so that you can discuss what these, what the images mean. We talked before about, you know, the holes from the craters and studying those holes can teach us the angle and the impact of the velocity, the size, the mass um, of the meteorite. Um, therefore, we can interpret the information gleaned from these holes, and it'll give us more information about the meteorites themselves. And we can discuss how the holes and the ejecta, which is the stuff that gets thrown out of the hole, um, how it allows us to glimpse beyond the surface of the layers of, say, the moon in this example. And we can see what's underneath. It's a really messy activity, but it really, um, I think, lets the kids really, you know, it really hits home um, how these are created and what they can teach us. Taking Earth's temperature, um, this one we're going to consider how the temperatures of the different surfaces might have an influence on our global scale, therefore is a great opportunity to talk about climate change. Uh, NASA takes measurements of the Earth to help us understand the changes in the weather system and climate. So essentially what the children are doing is a mini version of this by taking temperatures of the various items in their environment. Evidently something that's going to be better with your school age children and older. Um, does translate well to the teens. They have fun with this one and middle schoolers as well. So to do this one, this does require a little bit of uh, investment. Uh, you do need the infrared thermometers. Um, they're about $16 each on Amazon. You'll get all the links to uh, via Starnet of how to do all these activities. If uh, you're having a hard time finding any of these materials yourself, please feel free to email me and I can um, help you out finding these things. But most everything is either found locally, again, like your Dollar Generals or your Publixes and that kind of thing, or good old Amazon. So with this activity, they're going to measure uh, the temperature using the, the infrared thermometers of various items inside and outside if you can. And then they're gonna log all these results and you're gonna let the kids compare and contrast uh, what they found. And a good wrap up activity for this at the end is to make a little contest of finding the hottest and coldest things in the room and maybe discussing what do you think it is and then letting them try to find it and seeing where those differences may lie. Jump to Jupiter is another fun one that's uh, that's a uh, fairly easy doesn't require uh, too much cost investment it's a. Uh, basically a larger scale version of the pocket solar system that Valerie mentioned. So we're just trying, trying to create a scale model of our universe. Um, this is great for, again, school age children, but almost any group can do this and you can get more detail and get um, more into it depending on, on your age group. 
it, it's going to require a, a fairly large space to do this. It's a good one to actually do outside as you can, if you can. It's a good opener for other activities to pair with some of the other things that we've talked about. So the different objects obviously are going to represent the different planets. You'll need a measuring tape to measure this all out. Starnet links there will give you all the details that you need to create the scale distances. For the children said jump to. So essentially you'll be measuring um, to see how far they jump and then they can use that scale formula to see how many quote unquote, jumps it takes to get from Mars to Earth or say from Mars to Jupiter, et cetera. And then on Starnet, of course, you also find suggestions for objects to represent the planet. So the sun is a grapefruit, Pluto could be a little tiny piece of fine sand, a Jupiter, a wooden bead, and so on. Space Rock Sherlock is um, honestly one of my absolute favorite ones to do. Um, they get to be a detective and try to find an actual moon rock from a collection of Earth rocks. Uh, or sorry, a space rock from a collection of, of uh, earth rocks. Uh, definitely a school age and up. Um, you do not want to do this one with younger children. Um, it, this one, again, does require some investment in tools and supplies. So this is, this is one of these activities that, you know, you want to go to your friend's group, perhaps, to see if they'll invest in. But the good part about this is it's an initial investment, but it's not something that you use once and use up and can't do it again. You're going to have this. And I've used this um, activity uh, many, many times. Uh, the rock kits are about $10 each on Amazon. And to get the space rocks, you can get five pieces. So uh, for about $17, so they're not, they're not too bad. Um, and then essentially what you're doing is the Starnet listing is going to give you details and descriptions regarding the characteristics of your space rocks. Then you're going to use this information to test the rocks and determine which is the actual space rock. You can use uh, the cheaper tests that you can do uh, is magnets, obviously an observation with the naked eye. There's scratch plates, you, scratch plates you can get very cheaply. Um, you can get a free magnometer app onto your phone, which helps with this activity. Uh, and then if you can, um, a scale, a simple little scale, about $10 on Amazon. And if you can, what's really great is the magnifying camera. That helps with a couple of different activities and it has a really great wow factor. Um, a simple magnifying camera that you attach to your tablet or um, your uh, phone is about $20. And to do this with a group, what I, what I do is create stations. So each station is one of the tests. So you put the kids, children into groups and then you move them around the different stations and it's uh, the most effective way to get the most amount of children to have this experience. But again, big wow factor um, on this one. And if you can arrange it, I really recommend it. So, and there's a picture of your little space rock. I kind of blabbered on a lot there and didn't give them a chance to change the, the uh, slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> so recipe for a planet in a moon is a yummy one. Um, this is creating our edible models of the Earth, the Mar Earth, Mars, and the Moon, so we can learn about the differences, differences between them. Um, can be messy. Again, the tarps that you had for your other activities might come in handy. Um, I don't know if we have another slide past this one. Let me go back up. Uh, but we're going to use uh, videos or still photos um, to show and explain the differences between the Earth and the Mars and the Moon. And uh, the ed edible materials are a fun way to illustrate these differences between the planets, you know, our oceans and the continents of Earth versus Mars thick solid uh, outer crust. So it's a little bit costly in that there is a lot of materials for this one, but it does have a pretty good wow factor. And I've done this with lots of different groups. Uh, again, can be done with younger children if you have a younger group, um, if you have uh, a lot of uh, adult help, but really uh, translates to almost any, any group because who doesn't want to eat a planet? So how I implemented the activities. Um, we've had a weekly summer science club for uh, a few summers now using these sorts of activities uh, where we kind of focus on a different one each week. Uh, we have a homeschool science club that comes that uh, we did for a, a season or two uh, where same same deal, we did different activities with them. Um, <clears throat> again, Starnut, I could not say enough. I mean, you, obviously Valerie and I are just sharing a few ideas with you, but there's so much more out there that you can do that you can tailor to your particular needs. 
outreach programs. Uh, again, the NASA My Library, uh, it's very important for us to try to reach the underserved audiences. So uh, we would do this through some of the local camps. Uh, again, Space Rock Sherlock was, another, was one that I would bring out there, uh, again, because of the wow factor, kind of hook them with that. Uh, and then obviously our special events. We had uh, a couple of different Apollo 11 parties this summer, where again, we would set up stations um, using uh, the art and the cosmic connection. That's also one of my favorites. I would also add to if uh, oil pastels, I often use chalk pastels with that. They blend really well too, and they can sometimes be a little less messy. Um, so you might want to try either of those. Crater Creations is a great station one. And again, um, also taking Earth's temperature. But again, check out the Starnet because there's just so much out there for you guys. This is, we're barely tip of the iceberg here with what we're talking about. Okay. Um, thank you, Patty. We're gonna- so, Oh yeah, so if anybody has anything they'd like to, any other questions for me? Again, myself, email is the easiest way. Um, love to answer any questions or help in any way I can to help you guys um, meet your goals. Awesome, thanks, Patty. Um, we're gonna stay on for some questions. Does anybody have any? You can type them into chat. You can hit the hand raise button. Um, we'll make sure we get you unmuted if you've got something you wanna ask out loud. And as Casey alluded to, we'll be um, sending out a follow-up message with a link to the recording and some slides and the information that you guys may find helpful. Um, so stay tuned for that. And thank you to Valerie and Patty for all this awesome information and these projects you guys have been working on. And we're gonna stay on for a few more minutes and make sure that any questions you guys come up with will get answered. We're just so thorough, they have no questions. <laughs> <laughs> you guys gave some great detail about these projects. Um, so like I said, we're gonna stay on for a couple more minutes, but that being said, if you guys have places to go, you don't have any questions. Um, thank you to um, Valerie and Patty for this presentation, and hopefully you guys will go forth and do some awesome projects, and we wanna see pictures. We want you to report back on these awesome things you guys are doing. Um. Yeah, and if you're available, we also have another webinar next week on the 3rd um, talking about uh, magnets and different resources. So if you're kind of looking at building your, your STEM and STEAM programming library, um, we will have um, Jose Sanchez from the National Mag Lab um, We've also, in case you haven't heard, we have a new Facebook group page called Flip Exchange where we're trying to um, help y'all connect across the state. And so I will also include that link in whenever I send that follow up. So if you're on Facebook and you want to join us, it is brand new. So we're still trying to get people to talk and have some conversations. Um, looks like we've got a question. Um, unmuting you, you've got your hand up. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself. It looks like you got yourself muted also. And Mallory actually has a question for the crowd. Uh, for the audience, are there any activities that you see yourself using in your library? And Megan says, um, I'll definitely be doing the Rice Krispie Planet project. Oh, cool. Well, we want pictures of that, Megan, please. Um. <laughs> I'm a fan of anything with food. Yeah. <laughs> food and messes were always my specialty. Yeah, I'm definitely food motivated, so I get that. <laughs> On the internet, 
There are a couple of other activities that involve food, so definitely look for those. Don't do that one on the first day of a diet. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other questions. Last chance. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask Patty or Valerie? Okay. I'm not seeing any. Thanks for being on today. Thank you again, Valerie and Patty, for your time and your effort to put into this. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, everybody stay tuned for the follow-up message. Hopefully we'll see you guys online again soon.